Welcome to Shahnameh, Book of Kings. Today we continue with the reign of Yastajid, the unjust. And so for a time, the father was in Iran, while his splendid son lived in the desert. Yastajid grew concerned for his sovereignty and summoned advisors from every province. He told his astrologers to look at the stars and tell him when his death would come and where his head and helmet would be darkened, how and when the flower of his life would wither. The astrologers said, It is wrong for the king of his to think on the day of his death. When the fortune of the king of king declines, he will travel from here to the fountain of Sioux. He will gather his men together and go accompanied by the noise of drums and trumpets to Tuss, and it is there that his death will come to him. The king swore an oath by the fire temple of Korad Borzan and by the golden sun, saying, My eyes will never see the fountain of Sioux, neither in times of joy nor in distress. So three months passed, and then the world was thrown into turmoil by a rumor about the king's blood, causing men to say that he had been unjust shepherd of his flock, and now all his sins were returning to him. Blood began to flow from Yazdijid's nose one day, and doctors came to him from every quarter. They stopped the flow for a week with their medicines, but then it began again, coursing down like tears. His priest said to him, Your Majesty, you strayed from God's path when you said that you would escape the clutch of death, which is like the autumn wind that tears the, tears the leaves from the tree. You must go in a litter by way of Shad to the Fountain of Sioux. Pray to God and make your way, weeping and penitent to that scorching land. Say, I am a helpless slave who trapped his own soul by an oath, and now I come before you, O just and righteous Lord, to know when my time will be fulfilled. The king accepted his advice, and with a caravan of three hundred litters, he set off for Shad. He stayed in his litter day and night, and still, from time to time, blood flowed from his nose. When he reached the fountain of Sioux, he came out of his litter and saw the lake there. He dabbed a little of its water on his head and prayed for God's benevolence. In a short time, the flow of blood from his nose stopped, and he and his advisers rested in relief. But then his pride and complacence took over, and he said, I've done what I was supposed to do, so why should we sit here any longer? Because of the king's arrogance in ascribing everything good to himself, a white horse emerged from the lake. It had a round rump like a wild ass and short pasterns. He was tall and had black testicles and eyes like a crow's. His tail reached to his black hooves, and he had a full mane. He galloped forward, raging like an angry lion, with foam flying from his mouth. Yazdegerd told his courtiers to have the horse brought to him. A herdsman and ten men, experienced in breaking horses, set off with a saddle and a long-looped lariat. But what did Yazdegerd know of the secrets of God, who had set his monster in this path? The herdsman and his assistants were helpless to control the animal. And in his fury, the king snatched the lariat and snaddle from them and confidently approached the horse, who then stopped, stock still, and stirred neither his forelegs nor his hind legs. He let the king fasten the bridle on him and stayed quiet as the saddle was put in place. The king pulled the saddle straps tight, and still the horse did not stir. Then the king went behind him to loop the crupper under his tail, and the stony-hoofed horse neighed loudly and kicked him so hard in the chest that his head and crown struck the dust. When the king was dead, the horse galloped to the lake, which was the color of lapis lazuli, and he disappeared beneath its surface. In all the world, no one had ever seen such a marvel. A cry like a roll of drums went up from the army. O king, it was your fate that brought you to Tess. Everyone present ripped their clothes and heaped dust on their bodies. Then a priest removed the dead king's brain and the vital organs from the body cavity, filling the space with camphor and musk. 
He wrapped the body in brocade to keep it dry. The king's corpse was conveyed to Pars in a golden coffin within a litter made of teak. So turns the world. And it is when you feel secure that you should fear its evil. Though you might rest, the world will not. And when you eat your bread, wine is the best comfort. While a man lives in this world, it is better to follow the faith than to act sinfully. After the king of the world had been placed in his tomb, the Persian nobles gathered together and wept. The lords of the marches, the priests and the great warriors, the wise counselors, all came to Pars and gathered at Yastagen's tomb. Gostahem, who had killed an elephant while he was mounted on a horse, Karen, who was Goshap's son, Malad, the lord of Pars and a breaker of horses, Pires, famous for his exploits with his mace, and all the other great lords whom Yastigid had treated with such contempt, came together in pars. Goshap, an eloquent or literate man, addressed them. My noble lords, no man has ever seen a king as wicked as this king has been. He hoarded all he'd stolen from the poor. His reign was murder, rapine, grief, and war. No one has heard of any former reign that was so evil or that caused such pain. We do not want his seed here on the throne, and from the dust we turn to God alone. Proud Balram is his son, and will soon find he has his father's heart and will and mind. Besides, he talks of Monzer all the time. We can't accept a king who stepped steeped in crime. All the Persian lords swore a solemn oath that they did not want any one of the seed of Yazdegerd to assume the crown and throne. Then they rose, determined to find some other king. When news of Yazdegerd's death spread among the nobility, various chieftains, such as Alan Shah, Bivard, and Shegnan, with his golden diadem, each thought, Sovereignty is now mine, from the earth to the moon's sphere, and since there was no king occupying the throne, the world was filled with discord. The priests and champions of Iran gathered in pars and discussed the situation, wondering who was worthy of the throne and of such a task. They wanted a just and generous man to quell the disorder in the land, since without a king the world was like an uncultivated meadow. There was an old, chivalrous man from a wealthy and noble family who lived in the borderlands. His name was Khosro. He was benevolent and had been successful in his life. Iran's chieftains bestowed the crown and throne on him, and an army of men from every quarter came to him. They told Bahram Gur of the bitter fortune that had come to the throne, saying, Your father, illustrious among kings, has died, and in dying he took the good name of the kings with him. An assembly of nobles has sworn that they want no seed of his to be the king. The Bahram, his son, is as he was, and that in both appearance and substance that he takes after his father. They have placed a man named Khosro on the throne. Balram scored his cheeks with his nails. He seemed desperate with sorrow at his father's death, and for two weeks the wailing of men, women, and children could be heard throughout the Yemen. At the new moon, after he had mourned for his father for a month, he gave audience again. Manzer and Noman and a crowd of Arabs came weeping into his presence, burned by their sorrow. Manzer spoke. Great prince of all of us, we have arrived in this world destined for dust, and we come with no hope of a remedy for this. Whoever is born from his mother dies. I see man's life as injustice and his death that is justice. Babam Gur said, If the name of king passes from my family, a great glory will depart. These usurpers will attack your plains, and the land of the Arabs will become like a pit of death. Mourn for my father. Then think how you can help me. Monzer chivalrously replied, This land is mine, and I pass my days hunting in these plains. You should mount the throne and govern the land, and may your reign last forever. All the nobles supported what he had said and rose up before the young ambitious prince, ready for war. Monzer said to Noman, Bring together an army, often a thousand young lions from the Shaban and the Cajun tribes. Then I will show these Persians who is king? No one gathered together a mighty army of warriors armed with swords and lances, and readied them to begin the attacks and to subdue the land. 
They trampled all the marshy country beneath their horses' hooves as far as Cestiphon. The people had no protector, and men, women, and children were taken captive. The throne was powerless, and the world became a place of plunder and burning. News reached Rome, China, India, and Macron, and the land of the Turks, that there was no worthy candidate to be king. All these peoples prepared to attack, stretching out their hands towards Iran, and each thinking to make their own lord the king of kings. When the Persians became aware of this, they scrambled to find some remedy for their plight. They chose an eloquent and perceptive priest named Javanu as their messenger, and he was sent to go to Monzer and say to him, Protector of Iran, and support of the valiant, when our throne became vacant, our country turned as red with blood as a Francolian's wings. We ask you to be our lord, since we thought our land worthy of you, but now you are plundering us shedding our blood and spreading rapine and warfare through our land, although previously you were not an evil ruler. Fear men's curses and reproaches. You're an old man. Take heed of what you say, and may it please and benefit you. There's another judge besides you, one who is above the understanding of the highest of men. Javanu traveled to the land of the Arabs, where he spoke to Manzer, and gave him the letter with which he had been entrusted, repeating all the Persians had said to him. The Arab king heard him out, but did not reply to the charges. Instead he said, You are a wise man seeking a way out of misfortune. Tell the king of kings what you have said. If you want a response, tell King Bahram what you have told me. He will show you what must be done. He sent a courtier to take Javanu to the prince. When he saw him, Javanu was astonished at the might of Bahram's chest and shoulders, at his strength and stature, and called down God's blessings on his head. The prince's cheeks were the color of red wine, and his hair exhaled the scent of musk. The learned messenger lost all his dignity of rank. He became confused, and his message went completely out of his head. Bahram saw that the man was bewildered and questioned him at length, gently and kindly and sat him on a throne. When Javanu had come back to himself, Balaam asked him why he had made the arduous journey from Persia. He sent Javanu back to Manzer with a courtier, saying that Manzer was to write a suitable answer to the letter. Manzer smiled, his face opening like a blossoming flower, when he heard this reply. He set about writing an answer and said to Javanu, "'You're a wise man.' And you know that whoever does evil will suffer punishment. I heard your message and the greetings you brought from Iran's chieftains. Say to them, Who began this? Who was senseless enough to start this war? Baram Gur, the king of kings, is here, splendid, powerful, and possessed of an army. And if you drag a serpent from its hole, you're likely to see your skirts dragged through blood. If I had been the Persian advisor, they wouldn't have been overrun in this way. Javanu had seen Bahram's face and talked with him, and he pondered whether Bahram was worthy of the throne. As he listened to Monzer, he had an idea and said, You are a noble lord who needs no one else's advice. Since the Persians lost their wisdom, many of their leaders have been killed. I, I am an old man looking to save my reputation, and you will hear me out. I will put a plan to you. You and Baram Gur, as king of kings, must come to Iran without warfare and strife. Come with your hawks and hunting cheetahs, as befits a splendid king. You have heard what the Persians said, and no harm will come to you there. You are a sensible man, far from all foolishness, and you will know what must be said in such circumstances. Manzer gave him gifts, and sent him happily on his way to Iran. Manzer, Balram, and an advisor discussed the situation in private. They agreed that, together with a group of warriors, they would travel to Iran. Manzer chose 30,000 Arabs, armed with lances and daggers, paint them in gold, and filled their leaders' heads with ambitious hopes for the expedition. News of this reached the Persians as Javanan Anu arrived at the assembly of their chieftains. The leaders were apprehensive as to what would happen, and they gathered in the fire temple of Borzan to pray, asking God to convert their state of warfare to one of peace and happiness. Monser approached Jerome, traveling across the waterless plain. 
King Bahram pitched his pavilion, and the army gathered about him. He said to Monser, You've traveled from the Yemen to Jerome, and now their armies and ours are face to face. What should we do now? Fight or negotiate? Monser replied, Call their chieftains here, and prepare a table for them. Talk with them, and listen to what they have to say. And if anyone gets angry, you must stay calm. We shall see what they are hiding and who they want to nominate to the world's king. When we know what they intend, we can make appropriate measures. If things go easily, we can put aside thoughts of war. And if they want to fight, if they won't fall in with our plans and show themselves like leopards eagle for prey, then I'll convert this plan of Jaram into a sea of blood. But I think when they see your face and stature and goodness, and how wise, cultivated, patient, knowledgeable, and dignified you are, they won't want anyone else for their crown and throne but you. And if they make a mistake and think they can deprive you of your position, then I and these cavalry will use our swords to bring the day of judgment down on their heads. When they see our innumerable army and our dignity and discipline, and when they reflect the kingship of your inheritance passed down from father to son as is right, and when they consider that bloodshed is our trade, and that God is our support, then they are not going to want anyone but you as king. Bobham's heart was filled with joy at these words, and he laughed aloud. As the sun rose above the mountain peaks, the Persian nobles prepared to welcome Bobham. Meanwhile, Bobham was seated on an ivory throne, and he wore a crown of great value. He held court according to the protocol of a king of kings. On one side of him, Monser sat, and on the other, Noman, his sword in his hand. Around his pavilion, circle upon circle, stood Arab chieftains. A number of the noblest of the Iranians approached the pavilion threshold. Barum gave orders that the flap be drawn back, and their arrival was announced in a loud voice. They called down blessings on the king's head, and wept as they did so. When they came into King Bahram's presence and saw the splendor of his crown and throne, they said with one voice, May you prosper and may evil be far from you. The king of kings questioned them kindly, then motioned them to place according to their rank. He said, My noble lords, you have seen the world and are inexperienced its ways from father to son. Sovereignty has passed me. Why then is the choice now up to you? The Persians answered, do not prolong our sufferings. None of us want you as king, even if you have an army back up your claim. This land is ours. The seed you're from has brought us grief and sorrow, filling our days and nights with sighs and torment. Bahram answered, It is true that everyone will wish to be a king. But even if you did not want me, why did you put someone in my place without consulting me? A priest replied, if you will join us in choosing a king, everyone will praise the process. Three days passed while they searched for a king among the Persians. Then they wrote down the names of a hundred noble worthy of the crown, throne, and royal belt. One of these hundred was Bahram, whose royal charm won many hearts. The hundred were reduced to fifty, and the debate grew long and earnest. Bahram was the first contender among the fifty, and this was so irrespective of the fact that it was his father's place he was seeking. From fifty they came to thirty, and from thirty the wise priest reduced the number to four, of which Bahram was still the first. But when the discussion seemed close to a conclusion, an old Persian said, We don't want Bahram. He is brave, foolhardy, and arrogant. Shouting broke out among the chieftains, and men's heart seethed with our anger. Monzer said to the Iranians, I want to know for good or ill, why are you so troubled about this young prince? And answer the nobles summoned many Persians who had suffered under Yazdegerd. One by one they presented themselves. One had had both of his hands and feet cut off. Another's body was in one's place, but his mind in another. One had lost both hands, both ears and his tongue, and he was like a body that had no soul. Another had his shoulder blades removed. Another his eyes gouged out. Monzer stared at these men in bewilderment. The rage swept through them. Balram was deeply affected by what he saw, and he cried out to his father's dust. 
If you shut your eyes to human happiness, did you have to steep your soul in the fires of hell as well? Mondra said to Bonsram, This evil is not something that can be pushed aside for them. You heard what they had to say. Now you must give your answer. Anger does not become a prince. Bahram said, My noble lords, you know the world's ways, and you have spoken truly. There are even worse things said that are still unsaid, and it is right that I reproach my father. All this is bitter in my mouth and has darkened my soul. His palace was my prison, and it was God who saved me. Tanish freed me from his snare. I fled to Monser for refuge because the king had never shown me any kindness. My men never have his nature. If that were to happen, all trace of humanity would disappear. I thank God that I have wisdom and that my soul is nourished on wisdom. I pray to God that he guide me so that I can cleanse men's souls and hearts of all the evil this king did. I am a God-fearing man, and I live for my subjects' well-being. I shall be a shepherd, and my subjects my flock. I will seek only peace and justice. I am magnanimous, cultivated, and careful in my judgments. An unjust king has no sound judgment. His wretchedness makes him vile and perverse, and no one should weep for such a tyrant. Sovereignty passes to me from father to son and I am wise and benevolent. On my mother's side, I am descended from King Shemaran, and my wisdom equals that of my ancestors. I have wisdom, good judgment, and greatness. I ride well. I am humane, and I am strong. I consider no one my equal in manliness, not in fighting or feasting or any other matter. I have a hidden treasure." which is those illustrious men who are loyal to their sovereign. I will make the world flourish from end to end with justice, and may all of you flourish and live happily. I will rebuild those lands the king's injustice destroyed and make them prosperous again. Now, I will make a pact with you, which I will swear before God to keep. Let us bring the ivory throne of the king of kings and set the crown upon it and then bring two savage lions from the wilderness and set them on either side of the crown. We'll tie them one on either side, and whoever desires to be the king will go between them and take the crown and place it on his own head. Then he will sit as king between the two lions, the king in the middle, the crown above him, the throne beneath him. We'll have no one but that king as our man as our king. Even if other candidates are just and nobly born, and if you reject my plan and choose some ambitious contender in place of me as your king, you will have horsemen's spears to prick and goad you. I and Monzer and our maces and swords will be there. Arab warriors have never learned how to flee from the battlefield, and will raise the dust of warfare over your kingdom and its province. Now reply to what I have said, and use your best judgment as you decide. Then he retreated into his tent, and the world was astonished by his words. The Persian priests and nobles who heard his speech said, He possesses the divine far. This is not said out of perversity or folly. He speaks about nothing but justice, and we should rejoice in this. And as for his talk of wild lions and placing the crown and the throne between them, God will not question us if the lions tear him in pieces, because it was his idea. Not that he would be pleased if he were to die, and if he does gain the crown, his glory will surpass Faridun's. We want only him as our king, and agree to what he has proposed. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends. <laughs>